Okay, it's something you did for the beginning. Okay, so surprise, me again, apparently. Uh, okay, so the first thing, just to get you people into a mindset, um, apparently the, the person who was going to do the talk on Composer uh, was not able to come, so they asked me to fill in. Problem is, I don't have any Composer and Joomla experience, so I'm going to introduce you to Composer and give a few hints of what, where it fits into Joomla. So if you're expecting something very focused on Joomla, it's fine, get up, go, I'm, I'm not going to hold it against you. Uh, but we're going to focus mostly on Composer. Cool? Yeah. Also, I haven't done this talk in a year, uh, so I may be a little bit rusty. Try to laugh at my jokes. Uh, can we get a sign so the people... Yeah, I'll... I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so... Okay. Mm. So, I'm Rafael Holmes. I've been working with PHP for over 15 years or so. Uh, I'm the leader at uh, Amsterdam PHP. I'm also secretly a Ninja Turtle. Um, yeah, but that's part of the, the game. In, the, in the, the greater PHP community, we also have a Michelangelo, so every time we get together, we, we have to make turtle jokes. Um, so Composer. Um, the idea here, what I want to show you guys today, is basically four parts to this talk. First of all, an elevator pitch, introduction to Composer so you understand what it is. Uh, then we're going to talk about the everyday things that you're going to do with Composer. A little bit of more advanced things, so the maestro class. Uh, and then we're going to talk about finding things in Composer and how it's going to help you with that. So first of all, the elevator pitch. What is Composer? Right? So we know before Composer, there was Pair. Has anyone here worked with Pair? Did anyone like it? Well, it worked. Yeah? It was good, right? It had its point. So basically the main difference between Composer and Pair is that Composer is per project. Pair is more of a system-wide installation. You would make a library available to everything in that machine. You could do it per project. Trust me, it was not easy. And it was rather painful. So Pair wasn't really good for that. Uh, the other difference is that Composer uh, has a central repository. You can have other uh, repositories as well. Uh, and Pair was mostly spread out through channels. So everyone had their own channel, was pretty much the way things rolled. Mainly because in Composer, you can get anything into the Composer directory, which is packages. And Pair, you had to go through this evaluation process, which basically meant almost no one got in. Right? So putting your library on Pair, not easy. Scales. 1 to 10, somewhere around a 10 or 11. So it was really hard. You're, there was a lot of scrutiny on top of it to make sure the package was up to standard, whatever that standard was. Uh, and, and that kind of slows down adoption. Right? It was good for the purpose it had back then. Nowadays, the way libraries are going and are being spread out, not so much. Pair hmm? So Pair is still useful because it also handles Feckle, which is installing extensions which is the one thing Composer can do yet. There is some talk about that. The day we can replace Peckle, then PHP Core has pretty much saying, given up on Pair, from what I hear. Of course, whenever we get to that point, that's probably going to change and someone's going to say, no. no. <laughs> but eh, that's part of it. Uh, so the problem you're trying to solve with Pair, with, with Composer, w what we're trying to solve is we need we have a team, we have deployments, and we need the versions to be consistent among everything. So you're working with one version of these external libraries, you're working with the same version, which is not what happened usually. You have one guy working with version 3.0, the other one's working on 4.0, and then you get the, well, it works on my machine. Yeah. Right? So Composer is trying to solve that, a way that you can synchronize among everyone, that everyone's using the same version, and also simplify how you get access and how you use those things. So to give you a bit of backup on the evolution of managing third party things in PHP, uh, it all started a long time ago with copy paste. Right? We all did that, download a zip file from places I'm not going to mention and drop it into your project. Right? And back then, you know, version control, what is it? We don't know that, right? So maybe we got started with CVS and, and then 
the first thing that came out was Pair. So Pair was the evolution of managing third party, but it was very restricted to the things that were in Pair, which were not that very much. Right? They were very good for base packages, but you had a limited set to choose from. And it was extremely painful to get that to vary from project to project because as developers, we work on hundreds of projects. We're not one project kind of people. Right? And before, you, you didn't even have Vagrant and things like that. So you had one developer environment, which was a mess, and everything was in there. A uh, bit afterwards, we found SVN externals, right? Subversion and externals, which was really good. We could point to a folder in a repository. So everything that was in a repository, which wasn't everything, we could point and, and get going quite easily. With time, we moved to Git, and I'm not really sure that was an evolution because git submodules is bad compared to externals it's worse because you couldn't even pick like the specific directory you had to bring the whole thing right so that was some of the limitations we found with git but it still it worked we were able to you know get things from third party and put it in our repository not have to worry about it well unless we had to run uh, update modules and all that kind of stuff um, but yeah, not everything was in Git. We had GitHub at that time, but that's when GitHub started coming up. So that was really good. We had something to, to really help us with that. Um, and then along came Synchrony 2. So this was, oh, I want to say two, three years ago, three, four maybe. Uh, and Synchrony tried to solve that in, in a different way. What they did is they packaged this little script that would come with it uh, that you could put a list of Git things and it will check them out and make them available to your project, which was very neat, very limited to where it got stuff from, but it was a very good start. And it was actually that script that kicked off Composer. So the, comp the first Composer release came from that script. That idea, let's make it better, let's make it more robust, let's make it more compatible with everything else. And then Composer was born. Cool? That's pretty much where we are in the evolution of things. There are other solutions, uh, <coughs> but if you look at the, the mainstream of things, this is pretty much where you would end up one day or the other. So to put all of that in one slide, uh, Composer is a query project dependency manager that will allow you to have your dependencies in the right versions consistent among everything that you're using. And it's gonna make it easier for you to share and find uh, libraries developed by other developers. That's pretty much Composer and all those characters. I didn't bother to count. Cool. So everyday things, right? Let's get started with Composer. The first thing you're gonna have to do, obviously, is install Composer. Um, this is, I'm gonna do a few disclaimers in terms of security to explain where we are with Composer right now. It's still in alpha, so there are things that are gonna get better. Um, Basically, if you access that URL from Composer, it will install it locally. Now, if someone manages to get in the middle of that installation, bad things can happen. So you might want to download the FAR directly from the website and place it in your system. That works just fine. Uh, you can either have it local uh, in the project you're in, or you can have a global install in your machine, which is what I do. I have one FAR uh, in my user bin folder. Tip put the FAR in there and make a proper link to user bin composer. That just makes you know, using it a lot more uh, easy. If you're using things like uh, Oh My Z Shell, then it has plugins for that. It's pretty cool. So that's pretty much getting composer. Like I said, composer is still um, in, um, in alpha. So if you install it, you're gonna get something like this. Version numbers are a thing of the past for composer but uh, especially for Composer the library, it's basically hashes because we're still in a, in a, in a beta release. Um, you can add the PHP execution here, but it will use the default one in the system. So if you have an alternative uh, PHP runtime, you can do that. <sighs> one thing I have found is that um, some people mentioned that running um, Composer on top of HHVM is insanely faster. Your mileage may vary but it's something you can try. Some things don't work quite well, like for example, Symfony depends on uh, libICU, which HHVM says what? So, um, so basically you install that, and since I said we're still in beta, 
you want to keep it updated. So running self-update every now and then is really good for you right now. Uh, every 30 days, it will actually tell you, hey, update me, because I'm really old, right? So the releases are still coming. Uh, like I said, I haven't done this in a year. So we are not at stable yet. We're walking there. One of the main things that it is being worked on to get to the stable point is security. I'll talk a little bit more uh, up front later on. Okay, so let's say um, I'm gonna try and go for a few roles here, right? So one person is trying to create a project, right? You, you wanna create something new and you wanna bring in third party code into that library, right? So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna be able to manage those dependencies. You wanna be able to tell Composer, hey, these are the libraries I need and you know, go get them for me. So what you do is you go into your project, whatever folder that is, and you create the composer.json file. Right? This is the main thing you need in order to manage dependencies, is to put them in your require clause. Right? In this case, Silex is a micro framework based on, on Symfony. And I'm saying I need Silex in version 1.0. Right? The composer is gonna say, okay, you need Silex, cool. Uh, and then you can run, yeah, talk about a little bit about versions. So you can define a whole bunch of versions, bigger than this, smaller than that. I'm gonna get into more details uh, further down. Uh, and once you run Composer install, it's gonna go and figure out those things. So the actual output for this, and this might be a year old, uh, is something like this. Can anyone see that in the back? Good, okay, good. Uh, it's basically gonna say, okay, I'm gonna get all these things, right? And if we stop to analyze, what the top things here are, are the dependencies of my dependency. Because I didn't list PSR, I didn't list routing, I didn't put all that in, right? The only thing I put in was Silex. However, Silex requires all of these things to work. So automatically Composer works out that whole tree and says, okay, you need this one, that one, the other one, and it downloads everything for you. And then at the end, it also gives you a few suggestions which these packages can make. So for example, if you want to use YAML configuration files, it says here, hey, if you wanna use um, YAML with routing, you can use the Symfony YAML package. You can just add that to your requires and then you can plug that in, right? So this is really cool for you to figure out how things you can do and, and, and you don't have to worry about all these other things. Like I don't care if I need all of those things, I just need Silex, you figure it out, right? So Composer takes that away from you. And basically it creates those files, puts them in a vendor folder and now you have third party code. Cool. Uh, like I said, versioning, uh, you have lots of options. You can select something bigger than version whatever, smaller than the other version. Uh, but what you really wanna stick to is the tilde operator. So the tilde operator basically means every release of this thing before it breaks compatibility, right? So semantic versioning, like um, Brian said this morning, Joomla is also following semantic versioning. If I say tilde one, it'll take tilde one, 1 1.0, 0 0 0.1, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, because none of those are supposed to break backwards compatibility. So it'll go all the way up to 1.9999999, but not to two where backwards compatibility cannot be guaranteed, right? So this is the best thing for you to put in your project, because as long as the other project obviously follows semantic versioning as they should. If you don't, we have people who visit people like that. We can, we can send them your way, just saying. Uh, but you wanna stick to that because then you're really getting the right versions, uh, you're really working with what you expect. Is that Sorry? It is and it isn't. There are some edge cases where this might get you some different things. So it's mainly in the parsing. If you talk to uh, Igor Wilder about it, he will explain the details of the internal things. I, I don't pretend to be smart enough to understand half of them. Um, but he said, use this, and I believe him. He's small, but he's insanely smart. Um, and also, um, versioning in terms of development and packages, right? Sometimes we, we should all be using stable packages. That would be awesome. We're not quite there yet. So what we have in Composer is the minimum stability stable. So it only accepts pack packages that are stable. This is now the default. It wasn't so a year or so ago. 
which means if I ask him to get a dev master checkout, it will say, whoa, you're asking for non-stable things. So sometimes you need to get around that. Basically, stable means that you're only going to get stable stuff, but you can get around that by saying at dev. So if you add at dev to a package, it means, okay, this package is allowed to bring in development versions of other packages. Sadly, you're going to run into this quite a few times because the packages are not all stable, not released yet in stable versions. Um, some packages don't even have versions, not even like a 0.0 or something. They just ask you to use Dev Master. That's bad. If you're releasing your software on a Dev Master, please tag it. You can tag alpha releases, you can tag beta releases that shows intent. It lets everyone understand what's going on. But don't make people use Dev Master. That's going to hurt either you or them at some point. So with Dev, you're allowing them to go ahead and, and grab unstable versions. Yeah. Um, now you load in another dependency, and that dependency has the same package as you are, depending on on Dev on Master. Then, then the Dev part. Then you're gonna get a conflict of because yeah. depends if you allow them to download stable versions. But basically, if you're saying I require this version, and it has Dev Master, and someone else requires Dev, it's gonna say, okay, these two are incompatible. You need to find common ground, yeah. right? So it does so conflict management. Match. The conflict management um, messages are not very understandable in some cases. It, it takes a PhD to understand some of them. But usually after a few times using it, you start picking up, oh, this is because this package and that package have a conflict and I need to go look at them. Um, I don't think I have any examples, unfortunately. Okay. But let's say you're you know, doing something and you had this awesome idea and you want to get a website up like in seconds and you want to do something with it, right? You want to start kicking off a project based on a, a, a slim framework or something. Then Composer has something which I find really good, especially for open source contributing as well, which is create project, right? So create project basically um, in this case, you have the, the FabPod Silex skeleton. It's a skeleton version of, of that framework, right? It's like a sample application without data or anything. It's just a skeleton, right? You can have, for example, a extension for Joomla. You can have a skeleton of the usual file structure, the config files and all that. You can have that as a skeleton. When you do create project, it's going to check out that repository as the root of your directory and then grab all of the dependencies. So it kind of kickstarts you into developing. You don't have to go, oh, copy this, create the folder structure, do this, create the, the default config file. It kind of gives you that whole skeleton, right? So if I do this with Silex skeleton, it's going to get me a checkout of Silex and that uh, structure. So if I run that, basically, the, the difference you see in the beginning here, it says installing the skeleton. Instead of downloading a, a, a vendor uh, dependency, it says installing. Okay. Guess, yeah, it, that that still requires you knowing. Okay. Um, Composer does have a few types, which I'm gonna get into, and you can type it as a. I think you can type it as a project skeleton kind of thing, uh, but there's no searching, active searching for that yet. So it's part of. It's it's, it's of yeah, it's part of knowing. <laughs> but usually, if you go to the frameworks page, it will have some hints as hey, use this skeleton. Or you just Google for whatever it is you're looking for with Skeleton and you'll find something. Okay. I was doing something with uh, Slim PHP, which is another micro framework. And I was like, there must be a Skeleton for it. I Googled and sure enough, I found one. So it's a question of finding the, 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 the right one. But there should be a mention on the documentation. Uh, so after you see the installing, you then see the usual uh, installation stuff, which we saw in the other case. Um, and it now checks the whole thing out. The only difference is when we did it the other time, it only touched our vendor folder. Vendor folder. I'm eating words. Uh, this time, we actually have something else, which is a complete checkout with the structure that Silex expects. Right? So you're going to have the composer JSON in there for you. Uh, all the log all everything that is defined in that repository is now checked out. 
And then you still have the vendor where all of these things come in. So for example, let's say you're contributing code to joined in. Do we all know joined in? No. You guys need to know joined in. You need to go talk to Lauren afterwards. So joined in is basically what the PHP community uses to evaluate speakers at events, right? We all, all the events usually have it out there so people can evaluate. And it's a great open source project. If you do create project and you pass in uh, joined in, I'm not sure it's on Composer. No, it is. It is, right? No? It's going to be tonight. There we go. <laughs> and well, basically what it does, it, it will check out the whole thing and you can even attach extra scripts. So it will give you like pretty much a working version and you can go ahead and do that, right? So not just like the, the, the Vagrant stuff, but this is just setting up the files so you can start doing something and contributing to that project. Usually I try to do that when I'm contributing to, I don't know, Symfony bundles and things like that. I just run the create project, it gets me that version, I do whatever I need, and then I start pushing PRs. It gets all the vendors, it gets all that stuff. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty cool way of bootstrapping development. All right, questions? Good. Uh, okay, so you already started doing your project, we already bootstrapped something, we're starting to work, uh, and then we find we're gonna need a new library to do something, right? Uh, and we want to add that dependency. So with Composer, you can then require other, co other dependencies. Like we mentioned that YAML is an option, so we can use uh, YML format uh, configuration. You just do Composer far, require, Symfony YAML, and whatever version, right? So this is what it's going to do. It's going to do two things. It's going to, one, update your composer.json file and add that requirement physically there. So next time when someone installs it, it they'll get that. Um, and it will download the dependency and put it up in, in your vendor folder, right? So the output is just like that. Updating the Composer JSON file, downloading the dependency, you're done, right? So adding new things is pretty quick. Finding them, I'll talk about uh, a little bit down the road. So the main thing that we had, the main issue we had with PHP before, whenever we use third-party code, we had to figure out how do I load this code, right? How do I find the classes? How do I, write? we had like hundreds of requires. Does anyone remember that, that time? Like required this, required that, that. That was really, it's what we had back then, but it wasn't good, right? It's not ideal. Uh, what Composer does is Composer fixes that. While Composer doesn't fix that, Composer basically makes use of what fixes that, which is PSR zero, right? So with PHP 5, 5.2, I want to say, the whole auto loader came in. Was that 5.0 five zero already? Only yeah. Still, only still in four, so that is not okay, yeah. And it got improved in, in two or three or something. Yeah. So auto loader came in. So basically, the auto loader was something that said, hey, if you want this class, I can now give you a function that finds it and loads it for you. So you no longer had to do requires. You just had to provide something that knew how to find your classes. Which was great, but then everyone was putting their classes in different places. So it was still like everyone had their own auto loader. Then you had to chain them and you had 500 autoloaders in your project. That still wasn't good enough, right? What PSR did was they defined a standard. So PSR is the, well, now they changed the name to FIG, but it's basically a standard recommendation for frameworks interoperability. Interop, right? Uh, which is basically the idea between all the frameworks trying to use. No abbreviation rather than swapping out. Well, there are some. <laughs> I, I keep creating enemies for myself. <laughs> but yeah, that's good. Um, so it's basically the idea of frameworks trying to code to the same standard so that things that one uses, the other one can also use, and they're all compatible, right? So that was the beginning of all that. Uh, it, it hasn't been moving as fast as some people would like, but you know, these discussions are always, well, they always end up in tabs versus spaces at some point, so. <laughs> that's part of it. Uh, but what Composer does is based, based on that and based on PSR 4, which was just recently released, which are PSR 4 and 0 both talk about auto-loading files, um, Composer generates the auto-load file for you, right? So if you go to the vendor folder, there's an autoload.php file, which links off to a whole bunch of other stuff and different types of auto-loading. But basically, if you include this file, if you require it, you now know how to inject any of the third-party code that you're using. Any class that you instantiate, any 
constants that you expect, any functions, it will know how to find it. So you no longer have to worry about all those details. It's doing all the auto-loading for you. Uh, you can change a little bit of how it works. So in your project, if you have a special namespace or whatever it is you're using, you can define how you want um, Composer to generate the autoload for you. Uh, if you have a PSR compliant namespace, then you can just uh, use the PSR and say this is my namespace and that's the root directory. If you have PSR4, it's pretty much almost the same thing. You're mapping namespaces to folders. You can use a class map where you say, okay, these are all the folders where there are classes, go read them and figure them out. Uh, and you can even use uh, file, which is useful if you're loading uh, PHP functions, which are not in classes. Right? If you're doing functional programming, you're going to need that. Not everyone is, but it's very useful for those things. This is one of the things that can make the Facebook SDK so much better. Because the Facebook SDK still requires you to require a file and then use the SDK for it to load constants and stuff. So it, if it does this, boom, done. Um, OK, so I now need my server um, to have all of these dependencies, right? And well, I also need to specify things like the extensions I need, the version of PHP I need, right? Because the worst thing for a developer, well, probably not the worst, but it's quite up there, is when you start working on a code and it's broken, it doesn't work as you expect, and you're like, what's going on? You spend hours and hours debugging, and then you figure out it's using a function in PHP 5.4, which you don't support, or which changed how it, how it works from a version to another, right? So if you put in the version of PHP that you expect, as soon as they require that dependency, you're going to get something saying, OK, your version of PHP is not compatible. So that stops you from spending two hours looking for problems. It tells you right there what the problem is going to be. Same thing for functions, for extensions. However, it cannot install exceptions, uh, ex extensions. I need coffee. Um, to, to get those things going, right? So it, it's really good for you to immediately know what the problems are going to be. Installing extensions is something that they're going to try and attempt. I'm not sure exactly when if and if it's going to be before the first stable release. I'm guessing not. Well, the question is going to be how. Yeah. Yeah, well, it'll probably have to go down the same path as, as, as Speckle. Speckle yeah. So that's why that, that includes a lot of security issues and a lot more dependencies that are outside of the PHP world. And since this is really focused on being a PHP package dependency, that may never be the case. It may be the case that we simply retire a pair and extract Pico from, uh, Peckle from it and make something new. Yeah. Right? That might be the case. I think that's actually better. Um, OK, so that's extensions. Does anyone here know Grumpy Programmer? Right. So I'm very scared of Grumpy Programmer. So I write tests. Right? I, I always write tests. And for that, you need PHP unit. Sebastian is going to be here in a while, so I'm also scared of Sebastian. So I make sure I have PHP unit in my system. And you can do that with the required dev tag. Right? Because your project is usually divided into two tags, two things. Things you require to make it work, and things you require to develop on it. Right? There are some things that you don't need to ship along with your project, like PHP unit is one of them. So with Composer, you can divide these two. And you can use required dev to say, OK, these I only need if I'm developing on it. Right? So that will get you, if you want to deploy this to production, you don't need those packages. If you're using it locally to develop, then you have those packages there. Um, uh, one quick question with the required dev. Uh, if I'm actually downloading the package, do I have to do some sort of, like, if I'm getting your, if, if I'm helping you out with your project, okay, yeah. Well, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're contributing to an open source project, you're developing on it. Right. So when you install, basically, by default, it will install the developer things. Okay. In production, you want to have a flag, which I'm going to talk to, which oh, that removes that. By yeah. default, though, by default it will get to the thing, yeah. Okay. The only difference that's not default is when you do require, it will add it as a regular dependency. But if you do require dev, then it will add it as a required dev dependency, not a required. Right? So check out. I'm going to get to that as well. Um, 
So installing and getting things going, um, how, the, how is it that Composer guarantees the consistency of versions, which I said at the beginning? So I'm going to dive a bit into the internals of Composer because not enough people know how it works in the, the end, especially with the lock and the JSON file. So let's see if we can get that out of the way. So the first thing that Composer has is the JSON file. This is a list of everything that you need and the versions which are compatible. Right? You're not saying a specific version, you're saying these are the versions I need. Right? Uh, and then you have another file, which is the Composer lock file. And this is one of the biggest issues with understanding Composer. People don't know whether the lock file should go into the repository or not. The lock file, what it has is a list of the same dependencies that were in your JSON file, but it has a list of exactly what was checked out last time we did an install. Right, so let's say I say, get me version 1. Point, well, let's say you're getting dev master of something, right? And it's on commit 555. The lock file will say, okay, I got commit 555, right? Whereas the JSON file just says dev master, right? If I run that same install without looking at the lock file in someone else's machine, I might get 556, and now we have two different versions, and we might have issues because yours works and mine doesn't, right? So the composer lock locks all of those dependencies, right? Let me give you a step-by-step. -step. You have two commands in, in, in Composer that are important. First one is update, and the other one is install, right? Big difference between those, you need to be aware of what they do. So update will read your Composer JSON file to see what you need, and then it will go to GitHub, or whatever it is, wherever that's hosted, and find the latest commit that matches that, right? So if it's a tagged version, you're pretty much going to get the same tag. If it's not a tagged release, you might get different commits and, and things like that. So it will go here, find all of the latest things that, like if, if we had version 1.1 and I run an update and there's a 1.2 up uh, available and it matches my requirements, it will go ahead and get 1.2, right? And then it will update the composer lock and say, okay, this is exactly what I got. Basically, that means if I now give this to you, you have the means to have exactly the same checkout I have. And you do that with the install command, which will read your composer JSON, but then instead of going to GitHub and finding the latest things, it will check your lock file and say, okay, these are the things that you want, so I'm gonna stick to these, and then it's going to go to, to, to GitHub and get exactly those same versions. So if you are a developer working on a project, you want to run install. 90% of the cases, you're going to be running install. If you are updating and getting new versions, then you can use update. And if you have one person doing that in the team, it's usually better than having everyone doing it and it just goes crazy because merging the log file is not fun. Uh, it can, but it compares just to make sure you haven't forgotten to add one or you have a new. Because if you have a new library as well that you add to Composer JSON, uh, install will update the log file for that new requirement. So it, it has to double check. It's just basically making sure everything is okay. In some cases, that might generate situations, but if you have a, a procedure for doing that, like every beginning of a sprint, we update the, the components, so one person does that, commits, and then everyone continues working on top of it, okay, yeah, yeah. that's better. The thing is, if you have multiple people running update, that's gonna get messy. If you have one person adding a new library with the install, it's not that much of a problem because it's gonna change one little piece, whereas the composer will touch the lock completely. So. It's a JSON file with a lot of extra information about what's going on yeah. there. But like one, one line, probably. No, multiple oh, lines, multiple yeah. Lines. So there's a lot of information about each package, like what was the commit, where was the, the file downloaded for. So it's basically, if you don't have a JSON file and you have a log file, you can pretty much figure everything out from there. Yeah. Uh, one question, how often do you run the install? When do you develop? Um, 
Yeah. Whatever, might have run updates a few times in between times. Exactly. So install, um, depends on how you work. I work with uh, release branches. So every time I start a new branch, I run the install, okay. right? So every time someone, uh, a PR was accepted, every time someone else did something, I run the install. So it's usually the first thing I run in the morning and the last thing I run at the end of the day, yeah. right? Um, so if you want to keep the team on the same page, make sure that Composer Lock is in your repository. Do commit it. If you're doing uh, developing libraries, you also want to have that Composer Lock file so everyone who uses your library gets the right uh, thing. Uh, if you're deploying to production, and then this is where the disclaimer comes in, otherwise Lorna will slap me silly, um, there are still issues. The packages, they're not, uh, they don't have any kind of checksum or anything. So if you, we are essentially vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks. However likely that is, I don't know. But the risk is there, and there is currently a lot of work being done on it. But as you can imagine, it's not something simple to solve. If you look at NPM and everything else, you know, they are still struggling to solve some of those issues. So we're aware, we're trying to fix it. Uh, one of the things you can do is you, you do the whole checkout locally, add everything to, to your repository for the deploy. So only the deploy branch will have all of the, the dependencies in there. Or you can do rsync, or you, know, you can pick up any, any kind of uh, deployment. But if you are worried about that kind of thing, then don't run Composer on production, because it is vulnerable to that. Right? Uh, but what you want to do is you want to run no dev, so you don't get any dev packages. Uh, you want to add preferred diff, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to download uh, tag releases and not check out repositories. Right? Because basically when it does the preferred source, it will actually have like checkouts of your code in the vendors folder. Right? <coughs> and you want to run optimized uh, autoloader, which is going to convert all of the autoloading into class map, which is a lot faster than trying to find files. Right? It basically gives you a one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, if you are developing a library, there's a few things you should be aware of um, to add into your file. So you have things like the name of the package, which is usually composed by a, a namespace and the name of the package. The namespace being your, like you're the vendor for that. So remember in Java, we had com dot blah, blah, blah. Don't, don't name it that, but find something unique for yourself, right? Um, type, so you can say this is a Symfony bundle, this is a, a, um, a, li a general library, this is a framework, all that kind of stuff. You can define those things, then you can add descriptions, keywords, things that will make it easier for people to find them. Um, license is something very important. Be sure to license your code and be sure to understand the license of the code you're using. We sometimes take that for, you know, for nothing and we don't look at it. Um, you should. You should be aware of the licenses you're using and there has been a few instances of license crisis which could have been averted by just being aware of things, right? Um, the one thing to mention here is the target deer. This is no longer needed if you use PSR4. This was kind of like um, PSR0 has the namespace to folder structure mapping. This kind of allowed you to skip a few things in your repository and put it in the right place when it's needed. PSR4 resolved this, so don't really need to worry about it. Um, all right, so like I said, contributing to an open source project, use create project, find the library that you're going to contribute to. Um, you used to have to add the dev, now you don't need it because now it's default. So just running create project on that open source project. DMS library, pretty good, by the way, if you guys want to contribute. Uh, you really need help. Uh, but it does things like filtering, input filtering and stuff. So there's a few cool things in there. So that's one way for you to really get started on, on contributing to something. OK, I presume all of you are going to contribute um, things to everyone and share code. If you do, please, please tag your releases and use semantic versioning. Does everyone know what semantic versioning is? Yeah, so basically semantic version. <laughs> well, actually, this is the technical name for it, right? Uh, but basically, it's, it's a release <laughs> process that gives you um, specific numbers to mean what your release is, right? So this is a patch release. You're generally fixing a bug. Uh, this is a, a minor release, which means you're adding new features, but it shouldn't break anything. 
and this is a major release, which means something could be broken and not compatible with um, the previous version. So uh, there's semver.org, and it has all that explanation. If you're not using versioning, that is the best template to start from and, 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 and work with. Okay, um, <laughs> I'm running a little bit over time, but uh, my Astro stuff. Um, so more advanced things. Sometimes when you're coding, you need to make sure you stick to a very specific commit in that dependency. Um, it happened a lot when I started using Symfony 2.0, which was like all up in the air. And it used to like from, from one day to the other, they would break backwards compatibility. It was awesome <coughs> to work in that scenario. Uh, but sometimes I found the need to actually, you know, fix things to a very specific release, um, uh, commit hash actually. So in that case, you can use the version modifiers, right? So in, in case you need this, you can add the hash at the end and that will get you that specific commit. It will stick to that specific commit and get it there. Whatever it does, if you update, whatever, it will stick to that one. You shouldn't need that anymore today, but in case you need, these are things to have in your tool belt. Um, you can also do, you know, dev, like we said, but you can also have like beta and alpha. So you allow betas, but don't allow anything alpha or, right? So you can control a bit more of, of what can come down the pipe. If it needs to get something that doesn't match, like for example, an alpha, it will, spit in your face, there's a problem, I can't find the dependency that matches what we need. And then you either have to lower it or go push a developer to release a new version. Usually pushing people to release new versions works. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Um, if you need to execute things, usually with the application there's some bootstrap stuff that needs to go in. Um, you can use the, the scripts area of the, the Composer JSON. So you can run things after an update or after an install if you need to move files from one place to another. Um, with Joomla, there's actually something interesting here. Um, according to that type I mentioned on the Composer JSON file, you can have custom installers, which do specific things because that package is of type Joomla extension, for example. So it can copy files, enable something in a config file or whatever. Um, that is probably the way that Composer is going to go to use it, uh, to use that, sorry, that Joma is going to go to use Composer to install extensions. Um, sadly, I don't have an example here to show you, but it's also pretty neat. Um, Cake, PHP, the framework also uh, worked on that, and basically all their plugins are now installed via Composer, and it does, you know, putting things in the right place when that's needed. So it'll run moments, it'll run things after and um, after after update and after install. Um, that pretty much gives you a lot of stuff to do. Um, okay. Uh, using custom repositories. So let's say you have a library that you need and the developer has not added a composer JSON, so it's not on packages yet. What do you do? Well, you go and you open a PR and you add it to composer. But okay, you can't wait until he does that. Then you can find another way to do it. Um, so let's say I'm, I'm requiring dev master of the hero super package, right? But that thing has a bug and I'm going to fix it and I can't wait for the guy to, you know, accept my patch. So I'm using his package and like I got to fix it. So I patch it up and I release a new version. So this is my fork on GitHub, right? I have my own fork of that version, but I want to tell Composer, okay, use my version for now because the other guy is out on vacation in a conference somewhere in Germany, he's not going to merge anything this weekend, right? So what you can do is you can use the repositories and basically here what you do is point to your own branch, right? What it's going to do is it's going to look at this repository, it's going to find a composer JSON which actually describes that package and it's going to say, oh, okay, I see what you're doing. I'm going to use this one instead of the other one, right? When someone finally patches it up, you just remove this do a composer update and it will grab the proper version from the original offer. But this is really good if you want to keep moving or if you completely fork a project, you can also do that. <laughs> that. <laughs> right, so basically you make sure you get your own fork from that. Um, you can also do this to create on the fly packages, right? So here I'm using a type VCS. You also have a type repository where I can basically say, okay, this 
repository in GitHub, describe package vendor slash blah, blah, blah. So basically, instead of adding a composer JSON to the repository, I create the composer JSON for that thing on the fly. So what people do, for example, before jQuery was on composer, don't, probably don't use composer for front end stuff, but as an example, they would have a jQuery repository described here uh, that would point to the jQuery download. So you would still be able to install jQuery through composer. Nifty for a few things, don't do too much of it. Um, so if you have non-composer packages, that's what I said, you can add the package name, version, everything. So this is creating a virtual package that you can now use, right? Um, you can use SVN or Git. Uh, there's a few other things as well, the direct downloads and a few other things. Like I said, this is probably a bit outdated. But to every developer, there comes a day when they need a pair package. Sadly, well, happily, this is dying out now. Even Sebastian gave up on, on pair packages, so I guess pretty much everyone's giving up on them. But sometimes you need a pair package. Let's say HTTP2, for example. Apparently, Microsoft still likes that. Hey, Composer can handle that for you. You basically add a repository called pair, well, not but of the type pair, and you point to that pair channel, be it the official pair channel or be it the specific pair channel for whatever library you're using. And then you require it with the prefix pair dash uh, the name of the thing and the usual thing that, that is described, like php unit dot de whatever slash blah, blah, blah. That's how it would work. So basically, Composer would then communicate to a uh, pair and get that dependency for you, right? <sighs> Be sure to remember the prefix, otherwise it's not gonna work. But do remember one thing, this is gonna add a whole bunch of overhead to your checkout because the communication to get the right information from pair is costly and involves a whole bunch of other queries. Uh, so for pair, add the composer JSON and send it to them, right? Get them to push to, to Composer, because basically now everyone is doing it. This A year ago, this was still an issue, and not that much nowadays. But if you need it, it's in there. Okay, just so I can let you people go, because I'm behind between you and your beer. Um, finding packages, that's basically where you want. You want to be able to share your things, and you want people to be able to find your libraries. Um, so basically, you have an idea, and I need a library that does what was a good example? I needed a library that could generate diffs between codes through PHP without going to the command line, right? I, that was something I did. Or you need something to do input filtering, for example, right? You can go up to packages. Packages is the repository for all of this, and you have a little input filter you put in, and it will show you a whole bunch of packages that have that. The most important thing to keep in mind is it's not in here, but it usually shows the usage statistics, how many downloads. This is an old screenshot. It shows you how many downloads were made for that package. You probably want to try and stick to the ones that have more downloads because those are more tried and tested. But it's a little bit biased because then new packages which are really good also don't have any downloads. So. Does it show H? Sorry? Uh, not in the search view, um, but then after you click on this, you get this page, which gives you all of the stats, which have co been copied over. Uh, it gives you the state of master and when it was re last updated, and it also gives you all of the releases, right? This is on 2.0 now, by the way, and I fixed a whole bunch of stuff. But it also gives you links to all the repositories, uh, who the maintainer is, you know, so you also want to get familiar with who the maintainers are. That's usually a good thing, see how active they are. Um, so basically, this is it. You're finding the package that does what you need. Uh, if you don't want to go all the way to the browser, you can do it from the uh, command line. So if you do a search filter, it will get you same results we saw there, a little bit less information. Like I said, this is probably not up to date. Uh, it probably has a little bit more information now. But the same results we, we got from there. And if you do a composer show on that package, it will give you that same information that was on the second page, right? All the versions that are available, um, all of that data that's on the Composer JSON file, so you can get all of that straight from the command line without having to go to the browser. And the requirements and all that. Uh, okay, one last thing. Private repositories. 
right? How does private repositories fit into this? Because packages is all about public stuff, right? Um, you can also use Composer to generate to store your company's internal stuff, not things you want to share with people, but things you want to share amongst your developers. Because no use having this all cool shiny thing for all the public stuff, and then our own private stuff, we're still doing SVN externals and, and Git sub modules, right? So what you can do is you can use Sadis. Sadis is like a very watered down version of packages, which you can run on your server, right? And if you go to the browser, the, 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 the page that it generates afterwards, you'll see how to install it. So you see here the type composer, um, and you'll see all the packages and the versions that are available. So it's pretty much a watered down version of uh, packages. It's pretty easy. You do a create project composer Sadis. We all know about create project already. Then you open the packages JSON and you list all of your repositories. Catch. The server, well the, the, the machine you're going to check out from and your deployment server or whatever, they need to have access to these repositories. They need to have an SSH key or whatever it is. You need to work that out outside of Composer. There are some other things which you can do in Composer with uh, authentication as well. Um, I sadly don't have an example of that. But there are ways to get around that. But you need to make sure that things are accessible uh, in the right way. And this can be even your own internal repositories, private forks on GitHub, whatever. Once you do that, you run the status build command, point it to this folder and point it to where you want the static page to be generated. Uh, and then you're going to get a page like the one we uh, showed you. In your project, you add a type composer pointing to your status install. I recommend using packages, whatever your company <coughs> is. Uh, and then you can require packages just like they were any public thing. Right? Um, Ah, that's it. So basically, once you have that, it will generate that little page uh, internally, but you can use it just like everything was available on packages. Easy. If you need help, um, the people over at uh, Composer Channel and, and RFC Free Node, they're very helpful. I'm usually in there. If people need help, I can always try and help. Uh, but also, there's very good documentation up on getcomposer.org. The original developers of Composer, they're very nice people. They're always willing to help. And, and so there's a good, good bit of people that can help you out and, and find solutions. Also, a lot of projects are doing more and more things with Composer. So there's a lot of examples to follow. Uh, that's it. So we went through the elevator pitch, every everyday tasks, some advanced stuff, things you need to have in your belt, and how to find stuff. That's pretty much it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do they all five have DMS in there and if everything No, 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 no. If, if three different libraries require one other library, it will install that library, and the other three will use that. It, it only has one copy of every it's vendor. For building the website, they just download the zip files to install in their Joomla website. Well, the thing is, they won't need to do that. Well, I'm not sure how that will fit into Joomla, but ideally, the, 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 the install process will fire off Composer. It will read the Composer JSON of everything, but it will only download one. So the vendor's folders will always have one instance of all the libraries yeah, okay. regarding how many need it, because they will be all in one place. That's probably different from what Joomla does now. And so as the developers, they should follow like a standard, have everything in, this, in a Joomla vendor folder. No, just the Composer stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So as a developer, we should all be using that standard rather than okay. make a distribution file that includes all the repos yeah. already. Yeah. So I yeah. think the premise is that it's not a plain install. The installation of the extension would fire off Composer, taking part over the part of the installation off your hands. Exactly. Yeah. You don't, you're not uh, distributing anymore an all-in-one package. Exactly. You're distributing so your package and a list of the things that are needed, right? So that needs to be, the, the, the core team needs to go through a whole analysis of what the best way to do is. I suggest talking to the Cake PHP guys because they have solved the same problem. Uh, they might have a few ideas to, to share with you guys. Because what you see now is that like if you have five extensions, they all five 
by just five different versions of jQuery, for example. Yeah. Because everybody uses yeah. their own jQuery. Yeah. So that's the thing, right? When you start doing that, you start getting into dependency hell because this thing needs that, this thing needs that, which is why I recommend the tilde operator because then you now have this maximum range of things you're compatible with. So if like I, I'm using version 1.2 uh, and your package is using 1.3, with the tilde operator, those two are compatible, I, I won't have issues, right? Whereas if I had put 1.2 point star, I would now have conflict between your version and his because he wants 1.3 and you want 1.2, right? So the more the libraries focus on doing semantic versioning, on, on, on tagging their releases, the less this becomes an issue. So now, it's pretty good. I mean, you, you, you started using it now, you haven't had that many issues, right? Like, no, it, no, it's, it's been... It's been awesome, even though a bunch of them seem to pull in dependencies. Um, yeah. It all plays quite nicely. And um, I recently packaged a, a library for the first time, exactly this. I found a library I wanted to use, and it was a bunch of issues. And I was like, can we have a different package? It's the one I know. I sent the email them back and said, how's it work? Um, so actually, <laughs> it was fine. It, it was quite straightforward to just put like a library in it. It was relatively straightforward to package and publish to um, Composer. So yeah. So now things are starting to stabilize. People are getting to the mindset. Like there's this really, this growing of the community around it. A year and a half, two years ago, when Composer first came out, it was hell. It was hell because everyone was requiring something else. Everyone was pointing the wrong things. No one released their, no one tagged their releases. And I, I spent days just trying to figure out, okay, how can I make this compatible to download everything, right? Now not so much of an issue. So every, uh, the things are picking up, right? And the more projects like Joomla and, and big frameworks start relying on Composer, the more stability we get all around because then kind of one group teaches the other and everyone kind of understands, oh, I need to do this. And the people who don't tag the releases or who do something wrong, they are quite fast, you know, pointed out and Shut people will tell them, okay, fix on. this. Shut up. Symphony um, uh, concept of yeah. placing all the code in separate folders, uh, one folder per package uh, within the vendors folder. Yeah. Um, I was very ent enthusiastic also about Cake embracing uh, Composer as well. Yeah. But they're still following the same standard. But with Joomla, there's already a standard that, that one extension actually has files and folders in multiple places. So, so how, how would did you look at Cake? You see what? Because I remember there was something like that as well. Because they have some things that need to be moved to different places, right? So with the custom installers, you can do some of that. Yeah. Right? Composer can still say, well, these files are in the vendor folder. These one are in the external vendor folder, and something else. So you can still manage that. No. You will need something else on top of it. You yeah. need a custom installer. You need some some other libraries around it. It won't work out of the box, yeah. but it's perfectly doable. I want to say Drupal is also doing something around it. I'm not sure, but it's it's an idea. Drupal actually changed their structure, but they're going through a major version rule, yeah. so they only offer yeah. limited time limited yeah. for that. So they did it much more yeah. properly, yeah. encapsulated. So that it, it's one of the, there are tens of ways to integrate it. Yeah. It's a question of really sitting down and, and finding out what the best way is. Do we want to commit to changing the structure? Can we make Composer fit the structure and then evaluating, oh, maybe in this version we stick to this and the next version then we move to that. It's, it's a question of really finding the, yeah. the best solution for now. Um, one more issue I see is that um, you mentioned a couple of packages that are using the MIT license. Yeah. Now Joomla as a whole is licensed under the GPL, which means basically any other package that is going to be included needs to be GPL as well. The beauty of this is yeah. that if you're using Composer, you're not embedding other people's code, <laughs> okay, yeah. right? The yeah. person is checking out the code, so you can get around that. Yeah, yeah. There, because you're no longer releasing a package with all that code in it. You're releasing a package that requires, and then people can install other things. Um, another thing that Composer does, which is pretty cool, is, so I, I showed you the suggests. That's also a tag that you can add. You can also do things like replace and <laughs> <laughs> uh, I forgot the name of the other tag, but you can say, for example, this package is like you have uh, monologue, the, 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 the logger. 
you can say you can write your own logger and say this logger replaces monolog as in it's fully compatible right so if, if someone says i require monolog but i have this other logger yeah. they're, they're interchangeable yeah. right so you can do that kind of thing so you cool. you have a lot of flexibility composer tries to stay out of it and just say okay ask me what i wh what you want me to get and i will go get those things yep. right which is Mostly what all the other ones do. If you look at NPM, they also have the centralized vendor folders. If you look at um, Bower, if you look at Bundler, you might cry a little bit, but <laughs> yeah. Most of them, like, w from what I know of the, 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 the core team, they looked at all of those and picked out the best aspects of it. Yep. And having worked with most of them, I find I truly love Composer for the simplicity and the way it works. It works a lot better than I've seen all the other ones. Like, version hell in NPM is like, a whole other level of hell. Yeah. It's yeah. I'm 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 done. You people are free to go. If anyone wants to ask questions, uh, I'll I'll be around. But I'll I'll let you get.